You're listening to Menopause Natural Solutions, episode 62, Fibroids in Perimenopause. Welcome to Menopause Natural Solutions, your podcast for all things perimenopause, menopause and beyond. Stay tuned as your host, naturopath Jennifer Harrington, explains how to use natural therapies to find your ultimate health and happiness during your transition. Hello ladies and welcome back to another episode of Menopause Natural Solutions. I'm your host Jen and today we're going to be talking about fibroids and fibroids are really really common in perimenopause. It's actually estimated that up to 80% of all women transitioning into menopause have them. So it's a huge topic that we're going to be talking about today. And look, the good news is that if you survive through to postmenopause, they tend to shrink and self-resolve. But surviving through to postmenopause can be a challenge for some. Most women with fibroids have seriously heavy periods. Flooding is the term that they often use to describe their flow. When you're bleeding this much, anemia is going to go hand in hand with the situation. Um... Really, when you're losing that much blood, you you can't keep your iron levels up. And other signs that come along with fibroids can include abdominal pain, feeling bloated or full, pain during intercourse, infertility, lower back pain, frequent urination, rectal pain. So, So what are fibroids? They are benign muscular tumors that grow in the wall of the uterus. They are also called lyomas or myomas for short. They can grow in isolation or in clusters. And the reason why we're talking about them today is because they are most commonly seen in the perimenopausal transition into menopause. And the reason for this is because perimenopause, well, during perimenopause, your progesterone levels start to drop first. It's not necessarily a time of high estrogen, but it's a time of relative estrogen dominance due to the lower progesterone levels. So think of progesterone as a supervisor. It keeps estrogen in check. And when there's not enough, estrogen runs amok. And estrogen is a growth hormone. When you think about puberty, it's the first time you've been exposed to high levels of estrogen and your breasts grow and your hips grow. And at this time of life, it can be when think uh, reproductive growths. So think cysts, polyps, endometriosis, and fibroids. So there are some other risk factors to the development of fibroids. And one of them is genetics. I'm really sorry, but if your mother had a fibroid, you are three times more likely to develop one. Now you've got to remember, it doesn't mean you will get one. There are action steps that we're going to go through later on to reduce your risk of growing a fibroid. So make sure you stick around to the end, especially if you have a family member who also has fibroids. And being overweight also puts you at a three times greater risk. All right, so if you have fibroids, you have treatment options. I seriously don't want you waiting around and hoping for a quick transition. There are options. And we're going to discuss some of them today. So the most invasive option, and the one I don't want you to think of first, but we need to discuss it, and that really is surgery. And if this is something that you're thinking of doing, I recommend you get two opinions. Just check that both of them agree that surgery is the best option for you. And once you've made that choice, yes, I'm having surgery, I want you to please reach out to me. Because you may not know it, but I have a very strong interest in helping women best prepare for a medical menopause. So medical menopause is an overnight menopause. So the longer you have to set yourself up and to prepare for this, the better you're going to go through the surgery, but also the subsequent recovery 
will be much easier for you if you've prepared. Other options include things like having a marina IUD inserted or using anti-hormone medication to put you into an early medicinal menopause. Or my preferred option is to start with the least invasive, most natural option first. And this is where I come in. Naturopathic treatments for fibroids can be very effective. Ideally, see if you can give yourself three months to put into trying some naturopathic treatment to see if you can get a positive result before moving into some of the more invasive approaches. So let me give you some ideas of areas that I focus on when I'm treating a woman with fibroids. I want to make sure they have the best hormone balance possible. So I want to increase estrogen metabolism or estrogen clearance strategies. I want to optimize progesterone production, but also sex hormone binding globulin. You may not have heard of sex hormone binding globulin before, and this is Surprisingly enough, a binding globulin that binds to your sex hormones or estrogen. And what this does is it makes it inactive. How we can increase sex hormone binding globulin is actually by consuming more flax seeds. That sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? So just um, add, I think the research was looking at two tablespoons of flax seed a day in your diet to help increase your sex hormone binding globulin. The research was also looking at it reducing your breast cancer risk. Anyway, enough about that. We're here to talk about fibroids. So what I also want to do is optimize your digestive function and the health of your estrobilome. Have you heard of estrobilome before? Estrobilome is a collection of digestive microbes that regulate the circulation and excretion of estrogen. So that's really important at this time. And they do this by producing beta-glucadonorase. And you can test for this in a GI map stool test if you're interested. But while we're talking about healthy digestive function, we need to think about foods that nurture and nourish the digestive system. So we want a lot of fiber. We want to make sure that we're having good bowel movements. So what we need is lots of fresh fruit and vegetables and salads and flax seeds once again. And so flax seeds are a fabulous source of fiber as well as being a phytoestrogen. So phytoestrogens are plant-based estrogen-like substances that are similar in structure to estrogen and can weakly bind onto estrogen receptors and effectively reduce the amount of available receptors for estrogen. So a couple of ticks there for flax seeds today. I should mention, depending on where you live in the world, flax seeds are also known as linseeds. So they're the same thing, just different names depending on where you live. What I also want to do is reduce your menstrual flow. So key herbs to reduce heavy periods are called uterine astringents. And you will need to see a naturopath like myself or a medical herbalist to prescribe you a formula. And common herbs I like to include are things like yarrow, ladies mantle, shepherd's purse or swarvine. That's one of the good things about being a, a herbalist is that there are so many different herbs that you can choose from and all of them have secondary and even tertiary effects. So we look at the whole woman to see well, what is this herb secondary effect and which is the best one for her. Uh, Next strategy is to look at key blood building nutrients. So you're losing so much blood every time you menstruate. We need to top you back up. So we need to make sure you're well hydrated, that you have adequate iron, vitamin C, vitamin B12. Um, Copper is one that I also look at, but I know some of you are self-prescribers and I never recommend self-prescribing and copper is one of those nutrients I would only ever give if I have evidence that it's low. Say, for example, a blood test and if it was your serum copper was low, then I know that you need copper in order to build your ceruleoplasm, which is 
think of it like a, um, a cup that holds your iron. So if you can't top your iron levels back up, you're having infusions and your iron levels aren't holding, you need to think, well, maybe there's nothing to hold the iron. Do I need more ceruleoplasm? Do I need more copper? Um, these aren't run-of-the-mill strategies. So uh, maybe reach out if you're having significant iron issues because... I think outside the square, there there are many nutrients that we need to, to build blood. It's not just simply iron. Anyway, <laughs> I went off on a tangent then. Coming back, we need to address and reduce inflammatory markets. And pain is this key sign that inflammation is present. Dietary changes are needed. Like one of the most inflammatory foods is sugar. So you need to move away from a processed diet and towards an anti-inflammatory real food diet. And what I mean by a real food diet is is the food that Mother Nature put on this planet. So if you can hunt it and you can gather it, you can eat it. If it was made by a man in a lab coat in a factory, it's a frankenfood or a food-like substance, and they can be quite pro-inflammatory, so you want to avoid them. So on your plate, you would have lots of salads, lots of vegetables, um, some animal proteins in there and some beneficial fats. Beneficial fats are very anti-inflammatory and quite often I would look at, well, do we need to add in a fish oil or an other kind of anti-inflammatory oil to help reduce your inflammation? We need to assess for environmental toxicity. I don't know if you listened to last week's podcast. If you didn't, go back and listen to episode 61 on xenoestrogens. Xenoestrogens are environmental substances that act like estrogen in the body, but they are very toxic. And there are simple strategies that my guest Joe Leah last week discussed. So go back and listen to to episode uh, 61 if you haven't. Because environmental toxicity, in many cases, is a key contributor towards the growth of the fibroid in the first place. So please don't miss that step. Well, guys, I hope you have found that informative. What I really, the message I really want to get out there is there are options. Best case scenario is you start with a natural approach. Change your diet. Add in some key uh, nutritional substances. And one of the, the key foods that we haven't discussed is broccoli. So I've previously done another episode on broccoli because broccoli contains I3C and DIM. And these are key estrogen clearance substances. So there's so many dietary changes that could make a massive impact to your to your menstrual cycle and to the the heavy periods and the growth of your fibroids. On top of that, I would add in key herbs and looking at how do we optimize you? What are the key nutrient building blocks? How do we get rid of inflammation? And assessing for the environment. Now, most women see significant differences with this. And what I tell my patients is give me three months if you can. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes they're like, I've got surgery booked in a month, in two months, what can you do? And we do the best that we can in the time that we have. And sometimes they see enough change that they delay their surgery or they cancel their surgery to give us more time to work together. But if that's not working for you or you've got quite an extreme case and you've been told you absolutely need surgery, I'm not going to go against your surgeon. If you and your surgeon have decided this is what's happening, I'm going to support you and prepare you for the surgery and for the medical menopause that happens at that day so that we can set you up for ultimately a successful menopausal transition. Well, that's it from me today. If you are struggling, please don't hesitate to reach out. I do offer a complimentary discovery call if you want to have a chat with me and just find out if what you're going through is something I can help you with. Or alternatively, I have a Facebook group. Why don't you join in the group and um, chat with the other women who are also going through the same things that you are? I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week. And I can't wait to reach out and connect with you again next week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to 
Menopause Natural Solutions. This podcast contains general information about menopause. It is provided as a guide and it is not intended to replace medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. If you have enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a rating and review.